What if I told you you could unlock the secret to unlimited wealth and happiness just by listening to this episode? Wow. You can do it in your spare time, right out of your tiny apartment, without any hassle. It's incredible. If TV pitchman Don LaPree were still alive, he'd tell you the same thing. He was the self-proclaimed king of the infomercials. Listen to this. Thousands of people bought into his money-making schemes until the government shut him down and his world crumbled. Get ready to hear the entire story. It'll blow you away. There's never been a better time to download a podcast than right now. You owe it to yourself to keep listening and then go back and listen again. Operators are standing by today on Death in Entertainment. Live from Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? Here in Hollywood now. Two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my God! Shocking new details that have stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. Ah! What do you call this thing, anyway? Death in entertainment. Why, hello there, everybody. Hello, 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 Deto Universe. What is going on? My name is Kyle Plouffe. And I'm Alejandro Dowling. Ooh, and today we get to go over the sad tale of Mr. Don LaPree. We're going to get right into it. But before we do that, I have an offer for you, Kyle. Okay. I am sitting right here with a piece of the Golden Gate Bridge, (laughs) and you can own it for just three easy payments of $19.99. I'm in. All right, great. (laughs) And one more thing. This is a true crime comedy podcast. So there will be giggles, all right? If you don't want that, then hit stop now. And if you're easily offended, go find another podcast, please. Go climb a tree. (laughs) Well, without further ado, let's do it. Mr. Don LaPree was born in Providence, Rhode Island on May 19th, 1964. We've got, we're we're going back to the Northeast, baby. I like it. I like it. You're proud. Yes, very proud. Don was one of five kids. That's a big family. Yeah. Everyone probably fighting for attention. It's small for the 60s in the Northeast, to be honest. Most people would have like eight to 12 friggin' siblings. Oh. <laughs> so five is modest. That's like having one today. I was just wondering if that might have influenced his future work. Ah. Trying to win people over. Exactly. And uh, manipulate them to do his bidding. Fight for mom and dad's love and affection. For survival. And perhaps some milk money. Ooh, mama. The family moved to Phoenix when he was seven years old. He was not a good student. Don dropped out of high school, a credit short, I believe, and he started painting houses for his dad's company in Arizona. Yeah, why not? That's hot as hell. Jesus Christ. Painting the exterior of houses in a place that's always 100 degrees. Ouchie, wah, wah. For extra money, Don would scrounge around for used furniture on the side of the road. And then he would resell it at this place called the Park and Swap. Uh. Not to be confused with the Pumpin' Pantry, which was the gas station I grew up next to. Yeah, Pumpin'. Don says he was only depressed one day a year. And that the rest of the time, he would focus on his next big idea that would make him rich. What's with the one day a year thing? He would only his birthday or Christmas or something, or just a random day? <laughs> a random day. <laughs> it's a figure of speech, Kyle. Yeah. He would only allow himself to feel the sadness for a limited time. Limited time only! <laughs> Calm down! Come on down! In 1988, he poured everything he had into a dating service called the 1828 Club. It failed to launch and led to bankruptcy. He was ahead of his time with that. What, bankruptcy? <laughs> <laughs> no, this dating service. Yeah, I mean, it's a smart thing to do back in the day. I don't, I don't know why it didn't, it didn't launch. Well, it was more complicated back then, these dating services, mm. because there was no internet. Yeah, they were like the VHS like video, like, hello, and they'd say something weird about themselves and move on. I like long walks on the beach. He's quirky. 
So yeah, that's not great bankruptcy, but like Phoenix itself, you rise from the ashes. Don got married to a woman named Sally Redondo. No relation to Redondo Beach. Eventually, they had two children. And together, they had about $110 to their name. But this was the 80s, remember, so it went further then. So that was like 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> After exchanging vows in Las Vegas, Don came clean with her about being tens of thousands of dollars in debt. Oh, no. So Sally Redondo left him for Tommy Bahama? <laughs> she stuck with them. Oh, wow. What yeah, a gal. She's kept her feet in the sand, wow, so to speak. What a gal. But he told her to fear not because their fortune was about to change. In 1990, together, this husband and wife team launched a company called Unknown Concepts a credit repair business. According to quackwatch.org, customers were led to believe that they could obtain credit cards or get financial assistance from them. But that wasn't the case. The business was a glorified information line. They merely provided sources and contact info for companies that could actually help them with financial relief. Wow. Deceptive, I tell ya. I would assume so. And it violated Arizona's Consumer Fraud Act. Uh oh. That's brazen. So they would charge people for this? They would yes. be like, okay, so you should call blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And that's our line for like whatever credit repair or for a credit card company. And that'll be twenty ninety nine, please. Mm hmm. Wow. It would be like if you asked me the movie times and I'm like, okay, great, give me 20 bucks. Welcome to Movie Phone. Yeah, and then I call Movie Phone <laughs> or I go to Fandango and I give you the movie times. Wow. But you could have just done that yourself. So they were like a Google before Google was Google. Exactly. Wow. The Lapris were swiftly banned from the credit industry in order to pay more than $5,000 in restitution as well as other civil penalties. Which tells you how shady this really was, because there's so many fraudsters that are allowed to stay in <laughs> the financial industry. Right. That's crazy. This reminds me of the guy from Nexium, Keith Rainier. Yeah. Because he had a similar scheme in the early 90s, and then he was kicked out of the business and then went and launched Nexium. <laughs> And that was successful for a while. Yeah, these stories don't really end well for these hucksters. <laughs> Don once told a Phoenix newspaper, quote, I fail at more things than anyone I've ever met, but I try more things than anyone I've ever met. I'm a good loser. Mm -hmm. The piggy bank is half full. There you go. I can and I will take off with your money. The happy couple brushed off the setback and moved on to the next big idea. You notice a pattern here? He's always got a big idea. Yeah. It's in the queue. And the opportunity to do it. I wonder how much of his fortune was started with his dad's money. Because mm. I know he says him and his wife had 110 bucks together, but people always say shit like that. Right. Especially to pump up their own story. So the next big idea would turn out to be cash connections. For fifty nine ninety five plus four fifty shipping and handling, you could get a thirty six page instructional guide on how to recover federal home association insurance funds. Listen closely; this is very convoluted. <laughs> the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development was sitting on millions in unclaimed refunds that rightfully belonged to people who had paid off their mortgages in good faith. So Don would call the people who were owed these refunds and offer to complete the process on their behalf, then take a cut for himself, which he claimed garnered him around $30,000 a month. Ooh boy. And this was in the early 90s. Yeah. Damn. But don't worry. He said there were enough of these prospective refundees to go around. There were five easy steps to success in this program. One, understand the system. Two, locate the marks, I mean people. Oh. Three, locate government phone numbers and addresses. Four, know what to say, which Don could help you with. And then five, rinse and repeat. Ah. No startup costs, no office, no employees. All from the comfort of your own home. 
I didn't realize that you're telling me he's setting people up to do the job that he's supposed to. Yeah. Oh, my God. He's like, look how much I made every month just calling people (laughs) and telling them about their refund. Wow. So if it worked for Don, it could also work for other people. Meanwhile, he probably did it for like two years before he told anybody and really Mm -hmm. like fucking rinsed out (laughs) (laughs) that rag. (laughs) Yeah, he squeezed that lemon. Yeah. (laughs) And that brings us to 1992. This is when he started spreading the word about his financial strategies through late night infomercials. And the first one was called The Making Money Show. Why don't we hear a little bit of it? I think I remember these because it would be like a fake talk show, right? A lot of them were, yeah. Yeah. His were more like direct talking to the consumer. Okay. The show you are watching is a paid program or advertisement. USA Network is not responsible for the claims and representations made by the sponsor. I just spent five minutes on the phone placing one classified ad in the newspaper, and as a result, I'm going to make over $1,000 cash in my pocket. What if your best friend called you up and said, hey, I'm making $2,000 a day out of my one-bedroom apartment. Get over here, and I'll share my secret. And don't worry, you won't even hurt my business. I tell How him long to would fuck it take off. you to drive over to his apartment? And what if when you drove over there, he showed you three totally different ways to make this kind of money? And what if he told you he had been making this kind of money month after month after month? Once you do exactly what he said, No, I would say, boy, you must really think I'm an idiot. Yeah. $2,000 a day, and you won't even impact my business. Come over. I'll help you. Who on earth would want to share that then? Yeah. (laughs) Because the more you tell people about it, the less money there is. Right. Doesn't make any sense just from that vantage point. (laughs) So these infomercials would become ubiquitous on late night TV throughout the 90s. And Don anointed himself as the king of the infomercial. Yeah. Much like Michael Jackson called himself the king of pop. Yeah. (laughs) I remember the guy with the um, question marks all over his suit looked like the Riddler. Yeah. He'd be running around like DC being like, hey, everybody! (laughs) Matthew Lesko. And at that time, Don ranked among the 10 most frequently broadcast cable infomercials alongside Ron Popeil, Susan Powder, Stop the Insanity, <laughs> and Matthew Lesko, the question mark suit guy that uh, you were just talking about. Ron Popeil, of course, the set it and forget it. And I, Body by Jake, we talked about that before. Oh, yeah, that was a big one. Huge. That one was a little more legit, though. Same with Ron well, Popeil. Yeah. yeah. If you bought his dehumidifier you could make some jerky (laughs) you know so listening to that last clip you can see why this blew up yeah because he really stood out he had these exaggerated fuzzy claims that sounded nice didn't make a lot of sense when you actually thought about it but it did sound appealing and ron appealing (laughs) He's unnaturally upbeat. He has over-the-top mannerisms. He repeats a lot of different exclamations with murky details. And for most people, his dog and pony show was comical and seemed harmless. Who could fall for that, right? What moron would be getting roped into this shit? Well, there were a lot of morons. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I fell for stuff like this when I was a kid. I got a letter in the mail for some reason when I was like 14, 15 years old. And it said, if you send a dollar bill in the mail, we'll give you addresses to send it. And then people will send you $2 back. (laughs) And I had literally a bunch of envelopes in my closet filled with $1 bills. (laughs) Marked out to all these random people across the country. And my dad went in there and was like, I thought you were selling drugs. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, I was sending a dollar to everybody. And they're going to send me three back. He's like, oh, really? <laughs> Did you get anything back? I never got to send them because my dad found it. And oh. thought I was like doing drugs thankfully (laughs) you got intercepted (laughs) i was just stupid it was way before i did any drugs well i was stupid too this isn't exactly a scam but i wanted to buy this princess leia cardboard (laughs) stand-up from the star log magazine yeah and i for what i sent cash in the mail to buy it oh no and every day after school i would come home to see if the stand-up had arrived and That day never came. Nope. They were like, thanks for the cash, idiot. Uh, Oh, well. 
<laughs> what did you want a Princess Leia cardboard cutout for? I was a Star Wars freak. Yeah. So I wanted... You know, Emphasis on the freak. I was collecting like a bunch of Star Wars crap. Trying to make love to some cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> Think of how cool that would be today to have that. We could display it right here in the studio. What a cum-filled cardboard cutout. <laughs> no, it was innocent. <laughs> I was a kid. I was a child. So do you want to hear about some of these other ideas that Don LaPree had that he would hawk on TV? Anything to forget about your cardboard cutout. Here is the incredible product store. Whoa, would incredible. Would you like to take a tour? Yeah, let's do it. Inside, customers could pay Don to display a brochure for their new business. Whoa. And in this infomercial, he's accompanied by none other than... TV's Alan Thick. Oh, America's dad who loves pedophiles. We just found out that he is one of the guys that wrote a letter in support of pedophile Brian Peck. After he found out Brian had sex with a minor. And he said... As and a have sex is actually way too kind of a word. He raped a minor. And Alan Thick in the letter said, As America's favorite dad. I know good character when I see it because I'm America's dad. So let's listen to this clip. Hello. Is that exciting? So. It gets more exciting. Let me tell you. <laughs> no, it gets more exciting. Located directly below this are brochures explaining your helicopter. I am excited. Somebody now. picks up a brochure, they read it, they get excited, and they want to buy it. I am excited. Okay. I, don't, I don't jump up and down like that guy Mike, you know, in the psychedelic uh, sweaters. That's his thing. I don't want to be a copycat. But when you said brochures, I'm excited. Okay. Well, if you're ready to take advantage of a multi-million dollar advertising campaign, for about the price of a tiny display ad in a newspaper or magazine, then you are ready for a showcase in the incredible product store. The totally new way to advertise. I hate to break it to you, but this incredible product store was an incredible failure. Ooh. And it disappeared very quickly. <laughs> Into Alan Thicke's pockets. Yes. He's the only winner in that scenario. Yeah, he got paid. And then there's the National Reminder Service launched in 1995. Remind me not to use this service. <laughs> it would provide people with reminders of important dates by sending them a postcard. That's nice, right? That's actually not a bad idea, to be honest. But then there was an optional gift basket available for $39.95. $100 value, by the way. And customers were encouraged to buy these gift baskets in bulk and then resell them to their friends. Oh, my God. <laughs> Good idea or pyramid scheme? You decide. <laughs> and then this is really weird. Apparently, Bob Zamuda of Andy Kaufman fame convinced Don to get a 900 number. <laughs> I don't know why. Get a 900 number. And then Don got into classified ads. He always was, but in the late 90s, he started pushing these a lot more. And the basic gist is, by placing classified ads in thousands of newspapers, it could lead to tens of thousands of dollars per week. His trademark sales pitch was, if you place these ads, you would make a ton of money, all from your tiny one-bedroom apartment. Tiny? <laughs> I live in a tiny one bedroom and you can too. And that tactic, of course, is trying to relate to the customer. Hey, I'm downtrodden like you. Let's yeah. make some money. Right. Classic manipulation. And that brings us to 1998. And this is a personal story here because I would watch his infomercials in the wee hours of the morning on USA Network that summer. <laughs> I remember them very clearly. This is a big one. Me and my sister would make fun of it all the time. And I don't know how many times we saw it. It was on every night, it felt like. Yeah. And this particular ad, summer 1998, featured Cindy Margolis. Do you remember her? Oh, yeah, of course. How can you forget Cindy Margolis? Supermodel Cindy Margolis. Yeah, so he's the king of the infomercials. And she was dubbed queen of the internet. Mm. And apparently the Guinness Book of Records listed her as the most downloaded person in 1999. You know what that means. Yes. <laughs> Hello, cardboard cutout. <laughs> I sent some cash for that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> to Don. <laughs> <laughs> Never got it. So this is really weird. They were going to star in this movie together called Undercover Angel. 
Never got released. Never got finished, even. Oh, uh, the people have been denied. But they started filming this movie, a romantic comedy. Don was trying to be an actor for a second. Okay. And he met Cindy Margolis on set. And there's actually a scene from it that was filmed. Oh, Why don't we take a look at it? This is when he spots Cindy Margolis in the diner. And a precocious child eggs him on. (laughs) Oh, boy. Here we go. You know her? What? That girl. What about her? You know her? Actually, I don't. Why? You're drooling. I'm not drooling. Do you love her? Do I love who? That lady you're staring at. I don't even know her. Do you want to? Eat your cake. You love her, don't you? You're too young to even know what love is. No, I'm not. Oh, yeah? What is it? This. Okay. Not exactly Laurence Olivier. Kissing a clown. (laughs) The movie went nowhere, but it did lead to this infomercial where Cindy Margolis was paid to appear alongside Don LaPree on the beach. Mm. Why don't we watch a clip from that? Don, all these people got your making money package, started placing tiny classified ads in newspapers, just like you showed them, and now these people are making a fortune. I'm jealous. Cindy, I stumbled onto this after trying a thousand different ways to make money. If I hadn't stumbled onto this, I'd still be painting houses. I can't believe it took meeting you to realize how much money I could be making. Well, most people just don't realize that there are so many incredible ways to make money out there And the greatest part is, is that you can do this in your spare time. You can start up your business with hardly any money and then use the profits to grow your business bigger and bigger. So you don't have to quit your job. No, in your spare time, you can do this right out of your apartment or out of your home. said that. And you can get started the same exact day you received my package. Received this package of jail, pal. (laughs) Oh, I thought you were talking to Cindy. (laughs) Yeah, I could. (laughs) But you can imagine... It's late. It's hot outside. Yeah. You were just on the preview channel for 20 minutes looking for something to watch. (laughs) And then you go to USA Network. This infomercial is on. It's very alluring. Like, they're on the beach. It's peaceful. Everything's very bright. Yeah, fake nature blasting into the speakers. Yeah. So it just kind of hypnotizes you to watch. Yeah. This went on for an hour, this infomercial. (laughs) And let's see another clip from it. This is one of the testimonials from someone that got rich. Bill, I'm looking at these deposit slips. Did you ever think, these are daily deposit slips, right? Did you ever think in one day you'd be depositing 3,700 bucks in the bank? Another day, 2,400. <laughs> Another day, 5,000 bucks. These are, da- these are daily, right? Yes, those are daily. You can read the dates on them. <laughs> Just because they're placing tiny classified ads. That's it. That's it. Tiny classified ads. And he goes on to say, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you how much money I made doing almost nothing. (laughs) But here's my face and name. (laughs) Eventually, Don threw everything into one big package he called Money Making Secrets, a collection of brochures, cassettes, and videotapes, all for $39.95. Or you could buy a 60-day course for $295. Warning, this might be a scam. Because those who made the purchase would get bombarded with sales phone calls and would be urged to buy 900 numbers and websites, all requiring more upfront capital. Yeah, they're probably saying, hey, buy this 900 number. Then they go, okay, I'll buy it from you guys. And they go, okay, great. And then they go buy it themselves and then give them the number. Mm -hmm. Wow. For more money. I have a typical customer complaint here. The story of Andre from France. Yeah. Kyle, can you help us out with this? Andre from France. From France. Uh, he was a Vegas resident that spent $8,000 in December of 1998 on the Making Money Secrets Package and other Lapri products, mm-hmm. which means you're just going to get crushed under the weight of the, the, the Lapri pyramid. <laughs> uh, the La Pyramid. La Pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I saw it advertised on TV, and they made it look like you could make a couple thousand bucks in the first few months. And the reason he signed up for the package was because he worked at a casino, he wasn't making much money, and he was scared that he was going to lose his job. And after making the initial purchase, uh, him and his wife, Ree, were bombarded with sales calls 
uh, they were told that as distributors for Lepre, they would sell dating, sports, and psychic 900 numbers via websites set up by New Strategies. The psychic numbers. <laughs> Those were everywhere in the 90s, too, like Dionne Warwick. <laughs> and uh, Miss Cleo Coleman now. <laughs> After they paid for the services, he said the websites were never established. Schweitzer says he couldn't get through to Lepre's customer service representatives. So they bullied him into getting all these products. He paid for them, and then they never even set them up for him. And then there was a money-back guarantee after 30 days, which was very difficult to actually get. Oh, of course. And here's another complaint. This is from a news segment on scammers. Uh Uh-oh. Get rich quick plans. They are convincing. Barbara Hall thought so. She was particularly impressed with the pitch from Don LaPree. He sells a kit that tells you how to start your own 900 number business. Hall purchased the starter kit for $65. She was surprised to find out how much more it would cost to get started. From $125 up to $2,000. And I'm retired. <laughs> I have no job. And I can't possibly see myself going to a bank and say, I want to borrow $2,000. Paul says the new strategies company tried to charge her to set up a phone line, but her credit card company turned them down. It's like you want to be mad at this lady, but she has no business savvy. There's no reason she should be setting up a business. Finding out that it costs $125 to $2,000 to even get your 900 number connected that is a very low number to start your own business. Mm-hmm. And so I'm realizing now that he's profiting off of people who are completely unknowledgeable about anything regarding business. And yet that's a low number, but you wouldn't see that on his infomercials. Yeah. They would never show you 2000 Yeah. They would say, oh, it's just ninety nine ninety nine to get started. Right. Yeah. Oof. His headquarters was located in Tempe, Arizona. And the Phoenix New Times described it as Anthony Robbins' wet dream. (laughs) Motivational billboards flank 19-foot-high bleach-white walls, flaunting images of scantily clad models on tropical beaches, and sweating athletes flashing brilliant white smiles. More than 200 telemarketers yammer into headsets against a background of soothing music. There are no walls, just endless rows of white computers on gray desks. Oof. Otherwise known as hell. Yeah. (laughs) By the end of the 90s, consumer watchdog groups were all over Lepre like oil on a snake. Hey, snake oil. In 1997, the IRS put a $1 million lien against Lepre, and he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 1999. But as the band Alabama once said, you can't keep a good man down. (laughs) Lepre bounced back in the year 2000. In the year 2000! With a new project after securing a $1 million loan from a credit processing merchant. Wow. Who would give that guy a million dollars? They know that he's going to make money. Even with the the fees and the liens and anything else that the IRS puts on him, he's still going to come out on top. He teamed up with a supposed nutritional expert named Doug Grant, who had formulated, in his words, a revolutionary new vitamin. (laughs) And now let's go back to (laughs) quackwatch.org. Let's look at Doug Grant's credentials. He went to the American Holistic College of Nutrition. (laughs) Quote, a non-accredited correspondence school that taught fringe methods and had no recognized academic standing. Yeah, he just shaved Barney and Fred Flintstone (laughs) off the vitamins. (laughs) (laughs) He's a new. You are not far off. (laughs) Shut up. These were essentially just vitamins you could buy anywhere. Yeah. So they were vitamins, but they weren't any different from any other vitamin. And he was just repackaging them? Yeah. Oh, my God. And selling them for a lot of money. Wow. The infomercials for this began airing in 2004, and Lepre dubbed Grant's product as the greatest vitamin in the world. Wow. And that it was the product of millions of dollars in research and a hundred studies from the New England Journal of Medicine. Hey, New England, what's up? There's no evidence that any of these articles actually exist, though. Mm. And Don even claimed that the vitamin was given the Gold Seal Award. Uh, uh, uh. Whatever that is. (laughs) (laughs) 
And some of the amazing benefits include the prevention and treatment of arthritis, diabetes, and cancer, which are the same benefits from Flintstone vitamins. Yeah. And as a side note, it would be his last one. Spooky. In just minutes, you could be completely set up with your very own vitamin website that's designed to do all of the work for you. Listen to this. You just send people to your website. The website will actually educate people on the incredible benefit of the greatest vitamin in the world. And then every single time, you get another 20 new people to go to your website and to just try the product you just made yourself a check for one thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it's always one thousand dollars. <laughs> it's a clean number. Yeah. As Don just told you, customers could earn commission checks by getting people to buy vitamins through customized websites that sold internet advertising packages. However, the marketing was mostly ineffective and it was full of pop up and banner ads. People were told they could become an independent advertiser for just $35. And then if you could convince 20 people to make the purchase of the vitamin, that's when you would get the $1,000. Uh. There's only one problem. 20 purchases would only come to a $900 profit. Hey, boss, my math ain't so good. <laughs> so it doesn't add up. Yeah, not at all. And more customer complaints followed. In 2005, the Food and Drug Administration cited Lepre for his claims that these vitamins could do all the things that he said they could do. And they warned him in a statement that his products were not generally recognized as safe and effective. In other words, he was lying. Oh, that's nice, though. A nice uh, stern warning letter like that. He's going to give a fuck about any of that. A year later, they would warn him again. Here's another warning. Here's a stern warning, sir. <laughs> oh, I get to keep selling as much as I possibly can and make millions of dollars? Yeah, but only for a limited time. But listen to this, Kyle. The business was shut down in 2007. Wow. After a raid of his home and offices by the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. After a raid of his tiny little apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't take long. <laughs> Your house can get raided, too. <laughs> It was so small, you know, <laughs> a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> what you got under that tiny little couch there? <laughs> a tiny little scam. <laughs> By the beginning of 2008, his greatest vitamin in the world websites were no longer functioning. Mm. But did they ever function, eh? Oh. And this is weird. In 2009, you remember Doug Grant? who developed this amazing vitamin, he was charged with first-degree murder Whoa! in the death of his wife and then eventually got sentenced to five years in prison for manslaughter. He bludgeoned her with a vitamin bottle? I actually don't know. <laughs> That's all I have on it. Can you look it up? Oh, jury finds Doug Grant guilty in bizarre bathtub drowning. Another bathtub drowning? We just came off the Aaron Carter episode. Oh... I thought maybe he showed his wife what she could be making if she started selling the vitamin. <laughs> she dropped dead. She was so shocked. <laughs> so I can I too can do this? <laughs> what happened here? <laughs> How did she die? Why do they think he did it? Oh, he he drowned her in a bathtub. But he got manslaughter. Gilbert, Arizona, April 3rd, 2009, after four long months of trial testimony full of twists and turns, including tales about revelations from God, lust, temptation, and greed. Oh, boy. Last week, an Arizona jury found Doug Grant, 43, guilty of manslaughter in the 2001 death of his wife, Phalene Grant, who was 35 when she died. Jesus. Huh. So this was around the time he started working with Don. Wow. Uh, if it was first degree, we definitely would have hung the jury four person who did not wish to be identified, told ABC News. Some people felt that he was guilty of first degree murder, and they felt very strongly about it. Ultimately, it came down to manslaughter for not making the 911 call and possibly by him not calling 911. Oh, so he got his ideas from William Shatner. Yeah. She's in the pool. She's on the deep side of the, the bath. So he did call 911, but way later than necessary we don't know because they... no uh, william shatner did. oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh what the jury seemed to have a tougher time explaining were the strange circumstances surrounding the couple's second marriage 
Hmm. There were no solid answers at the end of so many paths we went down. Wow. There is a story about it uh, from on 2020, which we could cover for Patreon. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> I want to know more about this quack. I absolutely need to know more about this guy. So he's out of the picture, and now Don is up for charges himself. Oh. Lepre's fraud investigation lasted four years. There's this other video I found from his website at the time that is not linked to this vitamin operation. Take a look at him, though, here. It's much later, and he's definitely lost his luster. I want to say thank you so much for coming to this website. You're a business owner. You got a great product. You got a great service. You just need more clients. So what do you do? I will show you so many amazing things that you should do. If you have a great product, you got a great service, it will absolutely blow you away. So fill out the form, and I'll get right back to you. He calls you. <laughs> Hi, Don Lapree here. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> Just on some conspiracy and fraud charges. You want to make a thousand dollars? I need a lawyer to pay for it. <laughs> give me a thousand. I'll give you a thousand. We both win, right? You give me one thousand. I'll give you five. <laughs> and I'm like, done. You got yourself a deal, sir. I'm in five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a beaten man there. He looks like he's just sweating from every fucking pore in his body. Yeah. Lepre's fraud investigation lasted four years. And then on June 8th, 2011, he was indicted by a federal grand jury in Phoenix, Arizona. He was charged with 41 counts of conspiracy, wire fraud, mail fraud, and promotional and transactional money laundering. Wow. He was accused of running a nationwide Ponzi scheme where he exaggerated the benefits of both the companies and products that customers were made to sell. That he essentially sold people businesses with zero value. <laughs> oh, God. Worthless. Worthless to everybody but him. Yeah. Over the course of three years, Lepre defrauded about 225,000 victims. Wow. And scammed them out of more than $50 million. $50 million. While the paid out commissions amounted to little more than $6 million. Wow. If convicted, Lepree was facing 5 to 25 years in federal prison. Whew. He was most likely planning to plead not guilty, but then he failed to appear at his arraignment on June 26th 2011. Let's listen to this news report. Breaking news out of Tempe right now as U.S. Marshals track down a wanted Valley TV pitchman. He was supposed to be in court yesterday, but he didn't show. Marshals tell us they caught him at a Warner Road in Priesta tonight, but they wouldn't release any more details about that. Wow. I can fill you in. They show a picture during this. It looks like his house is exploding. <laughs> Really? Yeah, they're like hitting his house with uh, like tear gas and stuff to get him out. Oh, wow. It's like Diddy. <laughs> oh, my God. It's more dramatic than that, it looks like. They really went after this guy. So, yeah, a day after he failed to appear at the arraignment, they arrested him. And the U.S. Marshals had tracked him down at a Lifetime Fitness gym in Tempe, Arizona, same city where he had his office. Mm-hmm. Lepree had been hiding in the facility for a few days. He's just in the shower, just <laughs> shaking. <laughs> Once in police custody, they noticed that he had deep cuts to his groin area. And this was not from an unsatisfied customer. Hello. Rather, it was a failed suicide attempt. Oof. He had Ooh. sliced his femoral artery, which is located in the lower abdominal wall. Lepree underwent emergency surgery and was arraigned at the hospital. They're saying his cuts were to the groin area. Yeah, well, with the lower abdomen into the groin, I guess. Okay. I don't know. He might have just been whacking it down there. <laughs> oh, boy. And not... And this, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Kyle, this is not a laughing matter. Oh, boy. Lepree's lawyer requested a temporary release from jail while awaiting trial, but the request was denied. This might not surprise you, or it might surprise you. I don't know. Lepree had a history of depression. I don't think it was just one day a year either, as he once claimed. Yeah. 
and he was being treated for that depression while behind bars. That makes sense, right? That whole upbeat demeanor and positive persona Mm -hmm. was not real. Yeah. It was about as real as his tiny classified ad scam. <laughs> That's why the that video we watch is so jarring. The final one that he did where he just looks completely unkempt and sweaty and... And his timing is off. Downright terrified. Yeah. You, he's you, slower. He sounds sad. Yeah. And you can tell he's really like doing this kind of voice, but it's not matching his face anymore. Mm-mm. Like he, he clearly doesn't feel that way. And no. He, yeah. Wow. And then LaPree posted what seemed to be a farewell message on his website, along with photos of his kids and home. Kyle, can you read some of this? Never stop dreaming. I tried to create the best product on earth, paid out millions, made very little trying to make it a success, Mm -hmm. had attorneys review my entire company, paid out millions in refunds, tried to make the commission and products better every single year. It was the same product every year. Yeah. And in spite of all that, I have been accused of something I did not do. I did not have the perfect company, but never once did I allow one thing to be done that would violate any law. Uh, Actually, he did many things that violated (laughs) many laws. (laughs) Nevertheless, (laughs) I like how I just quickly, nevertheless, (laughs) because of the majority of people did not make money, in spite of every one of them being able to make as many thousand dollar checks as they wanted. They were lazy. Yeah. I am left to fight a battle that will for sure destroy what energy I have left inside. Oof. Oh, I hope the pictures below will motivate you to take a chance. He's in- like Darth Vader without his helmet on. <laughs> I hope the pictures below will motivate you to take a chance in life and try to do the impossible. Look at my kids. It did not feel work- inspired. <laughs> yeah. It did not work out for me with my vitamins, but I believe that oh. being willing to fail is part of having a chance at success. Never stop dreaming, and for those who sent me testimonials of what you did because of some of my help, I am grateful I made a small difference in your life. DL, Don Lepree 2000 at yahoo.com. Is there a more dated email than that? I still have my <laughs> yahoo.com. So it seems like he's trying to play the victim there. Oh, big time, yeah. A bit of self-pity as well. Yeah. He made $44 million off of things that people didn't know what they were getting into. I meant well. Do you think he was a narcissist? I would assume so. Definitely has those qualities. Yeah. At 8.30 a.m. on Sunday, October 2nd, 2011, two days before his trial was scheduled to begin, Lepree was found dead from a self-inflicted wound on top of his bed in his holding cell. What? He had slashed his own throat with a razor blade and then covered it with clothing as he bled to death. Oof. That way nobody could save his life in time. Self-inflicted wound I always imagine as a gunshot. So I was like, how the hell did he bring a gun in there? Oh, okay. But yeah, slashing his own throat with a razor. Oof. That is not an easy way to go. And that is exactly what uh, Charles Rocket did as well. It's a gruesome, very difficult thing to do. He had two, though, Charles Rocket. Yeah, he went. He went hard. Don Lepree was 47 years old, Mm. but he looked 57 in that last video we saw. Oh, yeah. A health reporter for the Arizona Republic told People Magazine, quote, It's unknown how he secured a weapon in prison and how he was allowed to harm himself without first being detected by prison guards. It's unknown how he secured a tiny little knife in his tiny little jail cell. (laughs) (laughs) So what do you think? You think one of the guards slipped him the razor? Oh, for sure. Someone that had compassion? No, someone that probably got a thousand bucks. Oh. I, I know, uh, well, I used to work with a guy that worked part-time as a correctional officer in New York City at Rikers Island, and he would sneak in cell phones for people for $1,000 a pop. I asked him how many he would do, and he's like, ah, like 100 to 200 a year. So he was making between one and $200,000 on the side just bringing a cell phone in for prisoners that were in there. Perhaps making more than his salary. Way more. Way more. He was working part time. Oh, part time. Yeah. So he was probably making like forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, if that, mm. and making cash. This is that's better than any Lapree fucking scam going on. 
<laughs> so do you think Lepree asked for a cell phone and then he gave him a razor blade instead? Maybe. There you go. Make your call to God. <laughs> Sad, though. He left behind a wife and kids. Yeah, it's terrible for them. He left behind a lot of broke people as well. Yeah. So you can't really feel too bad for him, the person. But because he doesn't feel bad for the people he scammed, he feels bad for getting caught. And he's like, my life is over. I'll never be able to do this again. Right. So that's why he checked out. Right. It's not because he felt he it's not because he was so overcome with grief because he ruined so many people's lives and, you know, set them up for failure. It's because of him. I think that's a natural transition to final thoughts. Did Don LaPree have good intentions at any point and it just didn't work out? Or was this a bad guy who was knowingly scamming people out of money? I think it was a selfish guy knowingly um, scamming people out of money. I think if the you don't think he believed his own hype at one point no i think if you use if he actually was more hands-on and really wanted to help people he would be more of a consultant with these people and be like okay i know this is a little bit of money but if you're passionate about something this is what you need to do the problem is is he's getting people like that woman who's like oh i wanted to set up my own 900 number she probably didn't even have an idea for one Mm -hmm. like you need to have something to sell to people you need to have something of value to give to people for their money and their time. You can't just have a 900 number and be like, oh, I want 900, talk to me. And it's just you're talking to some old lady that is bored and retired and being like, oh, I'm going to be a millionaire now. So you would need some business savvy in order to make this work. Yeah, and so he knows that. There, there are people who are employees and there are people who actually have ideas and drive and want to do something you know, as an entrepreneur. Not everybody has that. So the fact that he was thrusting this on people for a small price of fifty nine ninety five, I think he knew what he was doing and clearly had all those people bombarding them with more sales calls. So he had the people who were paying to become marks, and then he had telemarketers uh, profiting off of them again. So he's like double, trip, triple dipping off the same person. Um, I think it was a well thought out and at a certain point, a well oiled machine that a well snake oiled machine. Yeah, that really fucked a lot of people over. And like I said, I don't think he committed suicide because he felt bad that he came to this realization, oh my God, all these people got screwed out of money. I think he was just like, shit, I'm never going to be able to do this again. I'm never b- going to be able to make money ever again. I'm going to be disgraced and not be able to show my face anywhere. True. And that's it. And then he took off. Um, he didn't see any other option. It was like, okay, it's over. This lifetime didn't work out. Well, you think 47 and you're, you're thinking worst case scenario, you're going to get 25 years. Mm-hmm. That's in his 70s. Right. He's getting out. So by then his life really is over. Yeah. So I get why he did it, but I don't think it's for, you know, the virtuous reasons that he stated in his suicide note. Right. I tried to help people and the only thing that got in the way was them. It's like, no, you sold products to people and forced money out of their pockets, and you knew that they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Let's be real. What was that like to sleep at night knowing that it was a complete scam? Oh, on his like Egyptian cotton sheets, it probably felt very nice Ugh. to go to sleep every night. He didn't care. He definitely didn't care. He, all he saw was the checks coming in, and that's what kept him going. Oof. What do you think? I agree. I think he had to know that all this was bullshit and that he was getting rich off of the desperate hope of others. Yeah, that's literally what it is. It's the, oh, my God, I can, you know, have a better life and all it's going to cost me is this little amount. This guy's going to help me because that's what he came across as. I'll help you do this. And he helped nobody but himself. But he was an entertaining showman. (laughs) I mean, I'll give him that for sure. He was part of the zeitgeist. Yeah. Listen to this clip from the Letterman show in the year 2000. 2000! Or, hold on. Around the year 2000. Around the year 2000! (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know that guy that you see on uh, late uh, late night uh, television, uh, Don LaPree? 
This is a guy, have you seen this guy? He, he shows you how you can make millions and millions of dollars by placing tiny little ads oh, in yes. papers around the country. Sure, yes. You've seen the guy? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's on the level or what. I was watching television late last night. Take a look at what I saw. Here's the guy, Don LaPrey, right there. Take a look. David Letterman spent thousands of dollars on quintuple bypass surgery when all of his problems could have been solved by placing tiny classified ads in newspapers <laughs> all over the country. Some would say that he's making a joke about something that actually caused a lot of harm. Yeah. For better or worse, Don LaPree made his mark on the media landscape. Absolutely did. R.I.P.? R.I. LaPree? R.I. LaPree. R.I.P. to people's bank accounts. Yes. Yeah. And hopefully they all recovered. Yeah. I would like to close out with an apropos clip Ooh. from the movie House of Games, written and directed by David Mamet. Ooh, mamey. A sucker born every minute, huh? And two to take him. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Do you hear that, Kyle? What's that? You've got mail. We got a mailbag here, folks. Can you believe it? Oh, Claire, oh, Claire, thank you so much. You gave us a very nice five-star review entitled Favorite Podcast with a U in favorite. So that lets me know you come from across the pond there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Claire says, hilarious guys, but most importantly, they put really good detailed and interesting episodes together. I look forward to Wednesdays every week for a new episode. I'm a deado. Bravo. Wow. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love ya. Yes. Everybody get on giving us a review, okay? That's the only way we can survive. If you're listening to this right now. <laughs> Stop what you're doing and send 1995. No, I mean five little stars from your tiny apartment. Yeah, give us five stars. <laughs> Write a little something. Yeah, come on. come on. That's all we ask. Other than going to our patreon.com slash death and entertainment for five dollars or ten dollars a month, you can get all of our extra content. People say it's worth it. Mm -hmm. You know? And right now, the latest episode we posted on there is a deep dive into the infamous interview. On Larry King Live with Brittany Murphy's mom and Simon Monjack, otherwise known as Conjack. Conjack. A man not too different from Don LaPree. Yeah. And you won't find that interview anywhere on YouTube. Uh, we couldn't even keep it up on YouTube because they were saying, hey, get this down. So what we did is watch it off the internet, record ourselves, uh, you know, commenting on it the whole time. It's about two hours long. So pull up a chair, get ready. And, uh, you know, sign up for the Patreon, please. And when I say Simon Monjack was similar to Don LaPree, it's minus the charisma. Yeah, no charisma whatsoever. But the same snake oil. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, other than that, go check out our Instagram at Death and Entertainment, our TikTok at Death and Entertainment, and YouTube at Death in Entertainment. And until next week, don't go dying on us. Bye. Bye-bye. You have just heard... A true Hollywood murder mystery. I have never seen anything like this before. The movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it. A place that manufactures nightmares. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Good night. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon.